Welcome everyone to the last stream of the season. Um, it's been an incredible ride, but we're kind of ending with an incredible bang. One of my absolute favorite musicians in the world is joining us today. The one and only Mr. Doug Weiss at the bass. Doug, it's so great to have you. Great to uh, be playing with us is Mark Michel at the drums. Uh, we open with a song called Someday My Prince Will Come. 
for the least of my knowledge, Doug would play this a lot with both Hal Foster as well as Kevin Hayes, Trio, right? Correct? Mm-hmm. Um, and we're going to continue with Joe Henderson's Inner Urge. Next one is um, Dizzy Gillespie's Con Alma. We're going to kind of borrow an arrangement by one of my mentors, friends, and heroes, the great Peter Bernstein, with whom Doug has played for, what, 30 years we're looking at? Oh, or something like that, yeah. Something? <laughs> Not sure that um, they've recorded uh, prolifically over the years in 
quartets uh, and different configurations. And um, but for me, the one that stands out is an album called Monk with Bill Stewart joining him on drums, uh, which for me is one of the one of the top, maybe two, maybe three, maybe, maybe the top guitar traders of all time for me. I mean, just an incredible, incredible album. Um, and this is an arrangement by Pete Bernstein, Con Alma.
ask a few questions. Okay. From, uh, <coughs> Excellent. When I mean, the the you 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 play with so many different cats from so many different generations. I mean, we I think you recorded trio with with Peter Bernstein with Mike Marino, uh, and you recorded with Al Foster as well as Bill Stewart, people from very different styles and genres and from I mean what's what's the baseless perspective when moving from a Bill Stewart gig uh, to an Al Foster gig which I know you, you something you did on the same day I mean do you change the beat to where uh, I don't think so I think that um, I bring myself to those situations <laughs> and I just try to show up and be present as I can be. And, uh, I mean, certainly the way that, that, that Bill places the beat uh, is going to be a little bit different than maybe someone like Al from Al's generation. Do you but feel but I grew up with Bill. So, so Bill and I were, like, kind of, you know, I mean, he, he was a little ahead of me in school, like, in terms of his, his development. Uh, but we played together a lot growing up. I mean, like, we were probably – probably 18 or 19 mm. when I met him. That's in Patterson? Yeah, I went in Patterson College. And, uh, you know, so we ha I, I, I kind of grew up thinking that's what's supposed to happen between bass <laughs> and drummers. That's just that's the way it is, right? So he kind of spoiled me. Um, but I've been lucky with drummers. I've had a lot of good ex associations and, and Who are meetings. some favorites for you to play with? Well, mm. like, I mean, Bill, of course, and, and uh, uh, Brian Blade. I'm playing, d working on a project that, that he's leading um, now called Life Cycles. And Al, for many years... Um, How many years are we talking about, Al? Uh, probably 22, 23 years. What was years. the first contact? I mean, where was the first time that you got either heard you or want to play with you? or? Well, I'd say the first contact was when I heard him. I was 16. I went to hear Miles Davis. And that Al band. was playing drums. And I, I, I knew it was Al Foster because his name was on the bass drum. <laughs> he had his name written on the drums. Cause and he was, the cymbals are this high. And the cymbals were high. And then I saw him the same year, I think, I saw him at, in Chicago at, at the Jazz Festival with Sonny Rollins. And I thought, wow, this guy's got all, wow, this guy's got all the gigs. You know? <laughs> and um, so, I, I mean, I never, it was one of those kind of weird things. Like, I never thought I'll be, like, his friend or play with him or anything. But I, I went to college and graduated, and I, I um got called by Chris Potter to make a record for, uh, I think it was for Criss Cross in 1995, and, and Al was on the date. Um, he didn't make it to the rehearsal. He was indisposed, so we rehearsed just with Kevin Hayes and Chris so Potter. Chris, so Chris played drums? Chris played some drums. Do you know that story that he, he gave Billy Hart a demo for that recording that they did. Oh, well he yeah. played drums on it. And he plays drums on, and and Billy goes, "Why didn't you just use the guy? The guy that sound, God, sound God, great the demo on the sounds tape. killing." <laughs> and Chris goes, "Oh, that's me playing drums." Doesn't surprise me at all. He also plays guitar, by yeah, the way. Yeah, great. So you know, you know, Chris is. Uh, I've known Chris actually since he was fourteen. So we we go back to, um, but uh, I haven't had the chance to play with him as much as I would like. But but uh, he was actually in Al's band at first. Too, the first tour that we did so any, anyway that's how i met al like on the on the record date he was he, he showed up and he was you know it felt good right away like kind of we had a, a rapport and um and then one day the phone rings one day no he actually asked me for my number at that point and then he he mentioned that he might have a tour and so the word had gotten out and then i got a call to do a trio gig with him with chris at this place called the Parkside Lounge, and which is on uh, Houston Street and Avenue C or something. It's just kind of a, a, a bar, you know? And so we set up. I got there early. Um, we set up and played, and actually the first tune he called was Footprints. So I started playing, do 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 Right, I started playing the bass line, and he said, that's not Footprints. And I was like, uh, I'm pretty sure it is Footprints. And then Chris turned around and said, no, I think he means ESP. And I was like, whew, good thing I know ESP also, you know. So that was funny. The first couple of notes were like, no, oh, what the hell is that? But then, then after the first set, I mean, I was looking up and I was seeing all the bass players in New York at the bar. Wow. Well, quite, a, quite a few people were there because the word was out that Al was going to form looking, a band, right? you know. And that was, he had never really had a working band or touring band before. So I went and I went to the bar on the break and it went pretty well, you know. Al was—he was—he was like, "Yeah, you played good notes." So, 
he, he liked he liked what I was doing and I knew that it felt good to me so, so when somebody asked to sit in I said no <laughs> <laughs> I was like no nope, this is my gig this is the, I this may is never the... happen again uh, I hope you understand and you know guys like well, a little crusty but not you know I mean you got to understand I mean you get you get an opportunity to play with someone like Al so anyway yeah I mean you know we've been uh working together since then we just played actually last weekend in new york which was great fun i hadn't seen him in two years because of the pandemic. Yeah, pandemic so we hadn't spoken on the phone we hadn't you know which is very rare actually um but it was great to see him and and you know, musically it felt like a big you know hug and a big you know warm homecoming to a place that i knew very well and you know one of the things we developed like something that happened on that last tune on you know on, on your bridge you kind of went for a double time thing and i just sometimes just go for it we just go in there you know and it was like that's something that i came came up with i mean by listening to to, to ron and tony and herbie for sure and the record footprint you know footprints from miles smiles and then just doing it having it happen with bill a few times and having it happen with 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 al and then, so we just had a, sort of decided that all rhythms are possible anything you know you can make that jump if you not that you have to do it every time either and in fact sometimes it's cool if i go and if if the drummer stays yeah, home the drummer stays there yeah, or yeah. vice versa you know that's something that bill and i used to to work on in the practice room back in our in our early your college days yeah early college days like he would say why don't you play double time and i'll play half time and then we'll switch and we just just to see what that felt like to do it and again, i remember playing like i'm playing a lot with charlie for sip and we would always go, we, we were young, we would always go to double time, and he would just stay there. Yeah. And he said, it doesn't need anything. Right. It doesn't need, you, it doesn't need to overdo th anything. I mean, right. You don't have to, which was a, a lesson that took me a few years to kind of get. Yeah. That can work, too. That can work, too. It can definitely, I mean, I, I just like, uh, I like rhythmic, uh, you know. Freedom. Yeah. yeah, well, it's just like, just like interest. I like it when it's interesting, and I like when interesting things happen. And one of the things I was just talking to Samia Hell, the pianist, about this the other day. One of the things that can be, that can kind of kill the grooves if everyone is on the same groove. Maybe I shouldn't have gone fast. Anyway. <laughs> no, but what can happen? It, actually, we we're talking about harmony, like more of the harmonic rhythm of a song. If everyone's playing exactly the same changes uh, and exactly the same, like say substitutions, it can it can be kind of cool. It can sound hip on sometimes, but sometimes it's that that can also sound like a little it uh, takes a lot of the mysterious aspects yeah you, you, you lose some of the about. mystery yeah. that's that's yeah. for sure so i mean don't hate on me people that like to do that I, I can do that too okay i can do the half step two fives and uh yeah anyway um so yeah let's Al, play another one let's play another one yeah uh this is this is fifa for fun okay by Wayne Shorter. Thank you. 
Next one is another one that, that that I think Al plays a lot. This is called uh, "You Don't Know What Love Is." It's one of a, it's kind of a staple uh, of the jazz repertoire, um, and I really love to hear your your take on. You're one of those guys who still went through the all ranks of learning all the songs by ear, learning all the songs, learning the lyrics, uh, which I think is starting to be a lost art. Uh, there was a minute in New York I remember coming uh, as as a teenager and I would kind of chase Pete down and a lot of other people and, and I remember that they would always be on my case especially Peter and Russell Malone have learned tunes learned a lot of tunes because if you know a lot of tunes you could play with vocalists and you could play with instrumentalists and you could and you really have a way of understanding this culture the, the jazz culture and I and I would love to hear your what's your point of view on this and what's your journey been in it and oh well uh, yeah I like songs um, for a few years at at uh, Purchase College I taught a class in repertoire which was really fun for me because and actually I got kind of inspired by Mike Moreno he I mean he has a class in uh, that he gives online I think now but maybe also he's teaching it at a few universities. Should be anyway, but he's teaching a class on on songs for film, like songs that were first heard in, in you know Hollywood films in the 30s and 40s, and it's great because you get sort of the like to hear and get some background information on like the original version of Stella by Starlight. And I, and I, I remember playing some of these songs with Buster Williams, and uh -huh. I would think I have the changes. Tell me, no, you do, it's, it's the wrong changes. I mean, the yeah, jazz right. changes, the jazz harmony of things. Yeah. is not always the correct harmony to song. Yeah, Buster is the kind of guy too that since he played with Sarah and I mean and and quite some other vocalists in his career, he would definitely have been pretty deep into the into the you know the actual like source material. And that's something that I got into with when I when I was I was roommates with Pete actually in 1990 we moved to New York. I moved to New York and shared an apartment with him. And and mostly what we did was was work on songs together. We played we played tunes. We'd decide like what the chords, what chords we liked of the original recording, you know, or the of the original. Actually, we didn't have access to the original recording. There was no internet back then. Right, we would have right, sheet music. Right. Actually, we had it on paper, and Pete would sit at the piano, and then we would just kind of like hash it out and see what, you know, maybe we'd have a couple of more modern recordings of of uh, like me I meaning recordings from the '60s and of of our heroes playing these songs, and so we'd kind of see how like someone like Sonny Clark would handle a song versus how like 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 Herbie would handle it or Duke Pearson or something and then you know everyone kind of had a different idea you know to to some extent like in any any recording of one of those songs I think that's one of the beautiful things about it is they're 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 quite malleable uh 
you know, in terms of, of the structure, you can you can really and it's, it's something I really got deep into with Kevin actually when we played trio. Yeah, that's uh, a that's some heavy repertoire. We would we would focus. often like be reharmonizing a song on the fly like every time we played it. Like Kevin really had not so much interest in wanting to play it the same every night. He was really a go for it and still is a very just kind of like let's try and see what happens kind of guy. So sometimes we'd modulate keys, we'd go to a different key in the middle of on the bridge or something or 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 we'd we'd hear ourselves, hear our way into some different harmonic areas using pedals or using, you know, putting trying the fifth in the bass or you know, and some of it came from Kevin, some of it came from me. We were just kind of really listening a lot and uh but then only, you know, like more I think within the last ten years I've been actually going back more to the source material and just kind of checking out the original version. And one thing that Pete mentioned when we were just on tour, you know, he mentioned one of the one of the activities that he assigns to his students is just play the melody for an hour, hmm. which which is as a practice, I, as an idea for for a practice, I think is great because, you know, the melody is 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 the melody, and then, but then how you play it, how you choose to present that melody, gives you sort of a like like an like a an inside track into your own musical identity and that little golden thread that they talk about like you kind of need to start looking for that as a young player like look for a way like to 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 like to find out what your personal opinion about how the song should be presented is you know does if that makes any sense absolutely i also think that for since the goal is to play for people for live people yeah and i think for the for for regular audiences not the jazz uh, students or, mu or fellow musicians, I think the thing that they take out, I mean, what really sits with them is the m is the song itself. Yeah. I mean, and the modern way of playing the song for a minute in the beginning and a minute in the end, and then 25 minutes of solos in between, doesn't always work for. I mean, it, as soon as you you play for venues, play at venues that are for people who are not the jazz hardcore audiences. Mm -hmm they really appreciate the songs yeah. well it depends on i mean if you're going to play a 25 minute solo it better be a killing solo <laughs> you know and if it's a great solo i mean i could there's certain people Absolutely. i could listen to you know and give, give me some examples that are favorites I mean, well like like i you know you can listen to mark turner or chris chris potter or seamus blake uh or bill McHenry, or gosh i'm going to miss somebody and some tenor player is going to be mad ellie DeGibri. uh I, you could listen to like any of those those maybe there's five that I just named, there's certainly many more. Grant Stewart, um, yeah, there's some great, there's so many great saxophone players, if I just think about tenor players, and how they might play on a song like Arigen by Sonny Rollins. I mean, it, it, like I could, I could really dig hearing them stretch out, and I love just to, to play, you know, like epic version of a song like that with someone that's really great, that is, like, yeah. you know, and, and would have someone like Al or, or Bill, or Billy Hart, or Brian, or Jeff Williams, or you know any of the, the great drummers. There's 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 more. You know Anthony Pinciotti. There's some there's some great drum Matt Wilson. Sorry, once I start naming cats, uh -huh. then I forget someone. Right, right, right. But uh, right. anyway, yeah, you know what I mean. Like like just um, I like to see what's what someone who's really a great improviser is going to come up with from night to night, and and so there's also moments. In, in, in my definitely in my life where I, I'm totally down for that 25 minute long epic odyssey type experience but then you know like but but most of those like all those people also will play the melody in such a way that that it engages you and that it that it grabs you and that it interests you and it's because they have spent time studying that and 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 that's part of their part of their practice I believe anyway this is let's let's give this a shot. I'm not gonna play a 25 minute solo, but I'll do my best to play a stretch a nice, out a nicer a nicer short one. All right. Um, you don't know what love is. Okay.
If ever I would leave you, oh, yeah. you can leave people with that. So the last song um, is a special one for me. Uh, I got uh, um, the first the first jazz album that I ever got mad about was Sonny Rollins' The Bridge. Got mad about. So. Oh, got crazy about. Got crazy about. That kind of mad, not like and I'm so mad. You guys sound too good. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, I've had records like that. And I'm but, like, oh um, man, you guys did that before I did. That's uh, illegal. <laughs> it's not cool, man. Um, and <laughs> I mean, I just became the greatest hardcore Jim Hall fan. And when I moved to New York, I tried to, you know, I, I would kind of chase him around. And then one day I realized that he walks his dog at a certain hour in the, in the morning. Oh, yeah, and in the I West would, Village somewhere? Yeah, yeah, and I would go and, you know, I would run into him by <laughs> chance. <laughs> and we developed with this With your guitar on your thing. back? Exactly. <laughs> I just happened to be with my guitar at 7.30 in the morning. Yeah, right. And one of the songs that I that I got to play for him was this song, and he told me that he loved the song when he recorded it with Sonny Rollins. Um, and the, the, the first thing he said, he said, I think I played it out of tune, <laughs> which is a very Jim Hall thing to say, but um, yeah, right. you recorded this with Kevin Hayes and just an incredible version with that trio that you have with, with Kevin and Bill Stewart. Uh, I guess so, yeah, I guess that's true. Uh, we used to play that a lot on tour. That was This tune? Yeah, that was one of the ones that, that, that also harmonically kind of evolved over the years and with, with Kevin. And, I think um, Kevin is always changing harmony in such a brilliant way on a night-to-night on a, on a night -night basis. Yeah, it's no, it's cool. you got to be on your toes. If you're, yeah, I remember um, yeah, a few years ago, a mutual friend of ours, a uh, bass player um, from Israel, uh, Barack Mori, great Barack Mori, he says it low, by the way. Yeah, he, oh, great. He had his first, uh, like his first opportunity to play with Kevin, and he said he called me up and he said, "Man, I'm nervous. What do I, huh. what do I do?" Because, and I said, "Dad, yeah, just stay home. Just stay home and enjoy listening, and not having to worry about whether you know, because Kevin will go, you know, and you can and it, actually, in a way, one of the things I learned f through playing with him and and maybe Mark Copeland also and and Sullivan Fortner now, is that and and. You know, and Adam Birnbaum is is that sometimes it's cool, like if the piano's if the pianist is stretching the harmony and kind of taking it somewhere else. Sometimes it's cool for the a lot of times it's cool for the bass player just to kind of stay home. Again, it's that sort of study and contrast, and it depends on you know when you need tension in the music. And sometimes the tension is 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 you know of of the pianist sort of you know gently or maybe not even that gently like like going against the grain harmonically or you know i think brad meldow is kind of a, I a always master of that, that too that brad know? with whom we always also work with that he kind of got something from kevin it was a minute before him on the scene of reharmonizing things in a in a specific way that comes from herbie hancock in a way but they kind of put it into the modern language yeah i don't know about that um i know that kevin and brad knew each other like basically since they were 16 they knew about each other and i know that they're both you know they both kind of hit the scene around the same time the the difference was that kevin was actually before all of us in new york before any people from my generation he was on the road with like benny golson and people like that when he was you know just a just a really young and we were all playing at, at augie's <laughs> you know and, and kevin would be like oh i can't make it i gotta go to, you know i got this gig with with Buster Williams somewhere, you know what I mean. So he was already he was kind of working with, with some of the elder generation uh, of players er, early on, in a way that you know maybe Brad did some of that later in his career. I mean, he certainly played with Lee Konitz and he recorded with Charlie Wayne Hayden, yeah. and Charlie Hayden and Paul Motion. But but like Brad's thing was, he developed into a, a band leader quite quite early on. So he he was calling the shots a lot of times, and and it, and it was. You know, it's great, great opportunity for him to do so. And, and I wanted to, I wanted to get your perspective and feedback on what is it like. Uh, what was it like to get this hands-on experience from the one, two, three generations before you? Because I think that one of the reasons why I'm going to spend a lot more time in New York next year is because I feel that those opportunities that I got when I was there for the ten years I was there were. To get a certain time feel and a certain sense of melody and a certain sense of 
what the music is like culturally mm -hmm. that I that might be kind of disappearing as people just learn from sc at schools. And I would love to hear your perspective on this. Well, I think okay, Dekel, I think you're really it's really smart for you to 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 do that because you know uh, there's there's not that much time left. Unfortunately, and, and it's sadly as we've seen in the pandemic, and Barry Harris just passed away a couple of weeks ago. Like I, think the, week, right? I think the I think the his wake is today. I think the the funeral is today. Oh yeah, the, there's a yeah. So, uh, and, B and Barry, of course, was one of the greats, one of the great musicians of, of our time, and one of the great educators too. He really took that on, took that seriously. He really passionately wanted to tell people, show people how to do it and and why to do it and and but mainly how like how to how to phrase how to how to sound good and i think that my thing coming into a situation playing with someone like billy hart or with uh, victor lewis or victor like i played with victor quite a bit with with eddie henderson played eddie henderson band um and and playing with al playing with people of that generation george coleman you just you first of all you rhythmically want to be in a place where where you're not gonna you're not gonna throw a wrench into the works so to speak uh so i'm th very much there knowing that i'm an invited guest of of these african-american men that went through a much different upbringing and much different you know type of childhood than i did uh so I'm, i come in with a already with with some with quite i would say a bit of of deference and, and awareness of that situation and uh I mean, one of the people that really helped me along the lines early on was a, a pianist by the name of Norman Simmons, mm. who gave me my first, basically, professional break, which was with Joe Williams. I went to Japan with Joe in 1991, and he just kind of, he, he just talked me through it. You what know, was he it like working with Joe Williams? Oh, uh, it was great. It was like, like working with a great horn player. He had a great repertoire. The songs were, were amazing. And sometimes, and it happened to me, several times on this on this trip we were there for three weeks uh he would just call a tune that i didn't know and count it off he'd say two marvelous for words in the key of d flat one two one two three i'm going mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> like fishing fishing expedition looking at at norman like trying to like like my ears you know so so those kind of experiences and and actually the great thing that happened on the first gig i it was a tux we to wear tuxedos right so I showed up and I had a tuxedo that I had left on the floor of my closet. I looked. I don't look, even. I don't. I don't even own a tuxedo. Well, you can't do that gig then. But <laughs> and they actually let me know the day before. So I said, "Hey, listen, I didn't realize. So I'm, I, you know, I'm gonna have to. Yeah, I'm bringing my tux, but it's a little worse for the wear. So anyway, I, I brought this tux and he kind of looked me up and down, <laughs> and I sat down on the couch. Joe looked me up and down, and I sat down and I had like, not white socks, but some kind of light, like light gray socks. Wow. And he said. Get yourself some black socks. Ha. And I said, now? And he said, yeah, now. And so I ran out of that dressing room. And, I, and I'm like walking around Tokyo at like 7 o'clock in the <laughs> evening. I had an hour to procure a pair of black socks. I didn't have any Japanese yen. I had, you know, Unbelievable. like $10 to my name. And, and I, I finally just gave up. And I, came, I just came back and I said, I'm so sorry. Couldn't find anything. There wasn't anything open, but but uh, you know I'll, I'll have it together by tomorrow. I promise. And they were cracking up because he was basically just having a good time. He knew that nobody was going to see my socks when I was standing up behind the pace. Absolutely, yeah. But that next the next day, I I called the hotel room service or whatever, and I had them press my my tuxedo and wash my shirt, and and then I went and found some black socks. <laughs> and you and also I don't know if they even noticed, but it was just a funny. It was like a bit of a very light kind of like you know having a little bit of fun at my expense but it was also you know it was a great learning experience because i had to play songs that i didn't really know and i was really trying not just not to not to screw up that was my my baseline was if i got through the gig without having joe turn around and look at me like what's what's what are you doing you know or have norman look at me like come on you know and and it, and i recorded all the gigs on my cassette player not yeah, all yeah of them, the so. mini disc players remember those listen yeah i didn't this is pre mini disc i was <laughs> on cassette tape so those cassettes exist somewhere i used to i used to uh i used to have that same feeling of no just I, i'm just trying to make it through the tune yeah. of playing reggie workman's gigs and he would open with me playing duo playing countdown super fast duo with the drummer that's how I, we open 
Oh wow! And I would, I Ouch. felt this big, yeah. <laughs> e e every night. No pressure. Exactly. <laughs> um, you know, with Coltrane's bass player, well. And you also worked with Pete Seeger, another legend. And Bernstein just hit me up, said, "I didn't know that Doug played with Seeger." Well, that was okay. Worked with. It depends on what you. That was actually my first experience uh, recording remotely with someone who was not in the room. Wow. Yeah, so unfortunately, it was well. It, it, fortunately, I'm, I was happy to be part of that project. It was a a record called Tomorrow's Children uh, that was basically a, a children's record, a kid's record. There was a, there was a children's choir, and it was put together by this percussionist and friend of mine named P, uh, Jeff Haynes. Ah, he's great. I yeah, love Jeff, Jeff Haynes. Haynes, who lives in uh, Fishkill, New York, and he's now playing with Brandy Carlisle, I think. But we played together quite a bit with a singer named Liz Wright. In, yeah, uh, yeah, he plays with a lot of singers. He with Cassandra Wilson. He was with Cassandra Wilson before that. At Pat so, Metheny stint, I think. Was that? Yeah, the thing with Pat Metheny for That's a minute. That's true. He's yeah. got one of Pat's guitars, and so he's he's ah. a great musician, and he's one of the first people that I knew personally that had like a really good home studio. He just bought the gear, and figured out how to do it. And Pete Seeger befriended him. For for some reason, just just they got to know each other through some some kind of a gig at a school actually. So Pete would often stop by Jeff's house with his banjo. Mm. And just sit down, and Jeff would say, "Hey," he'd start telling a story or start playing something. Jeff would say, "Hey, man, do you mind if I record that?" And Pete said, "Yeah, sure." So he'd record some stuff. So Jeff has hours and hours of tape of of Pete telling stories, accompanying himself on the himself on the banjo, and then we would sort of create songs around that. And I'd always go in there, and Jeff would say, "All right, Dougie, here's a song." He'd play it for me a couple of times, and I'd sometimes scratch down a few notes, and and then I'd do a pass, and then I, then he'd always say the same thing. Can you just do a simpler version, like so simple? And so sometimes I would go in knowing that, and I'd play like a lot of, a lot of crap on the first time, just so I could play something on the tape. Right. Sorry, Jeff, that's what I did. But anyway, by the end, I'd play the, the most simple. And also it was a, that was also a great learning experience for me, because again, it was about not getting in Pete's way. And Pete also was, you know, 90 something when he was doing this so his voice was a little he was having a hard time singing he, he made it happen um, and and rhythmically his songs were I mean he played the banjo so great but it was almost like he didn't really need a band but we were providing yeah, him with some people, more yeah. stuff so so I actually my, I don't know if I ever got paid for any of those sessions I think it was one of those things where I was like I'll do it but I want to meet Pete and then the opportunity for that came, and I happened to be unable to attend. It was a, uh, like a live, uh, like they were giving him an award or something, and, I, and Jeff invited me, and I couldn't be there because I was going on tour. So that was it. I never got to actually meet the man, but I did see him one time in Beacon, New York, standing in the rain on the corner of like a two busy intersections. Yeah, legendary. This, this is the a beginning of, of the story. Gulf War. He's standing there in a rain poncho with a sign that said peace on it and he's a guy that didn't he didn't he'd done his time you yeah know, yeah, yeah, yeah you know but i that that really touched me you know wow. that was really this is before trump before the craziness that we have now in america uh this was just the beginning of yeah the beginning of the for, first gulf war he just said peace wow. that's it so anyway yeah that was uh, my my experience with, with pete Seeger was i wish it had been deeper i wish i'd have been able to actually get to to just greet him and touch his hand and, and tell him how much he meant to me and to my kids growing up. Absolutely. To, he was such a great... And to Peter artist. Bernstein. And to Peter just, Bernstein. It was just a chance for me to say how much he means to me yeah. and uh, how much I love him. Yeah. Um, we're going to close the set. Doug, it's been so great having you. I mean, really. Thank you. It's so Thanks great to play with you, yeah. to see, to hang with you, Mark, hear Mark the stories. Uh, Cooking. At the drums, Mark Michel. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much to Jazz Times Magazine for hosting this Sugar Microphones uh, Rope Up Records uh, Category 5 Amplifiers Gibson and Ken McKay Guitars uh, our amazing producer McKenzie and everyone at Deep Green uh, MS uh, Recording who's, who, are, who are hosting the session and if I'm forgetting someone I love you um, this is um, If Ever I Would Leave You and speaking of songs, and speaking of Cassandra Wilson, there's an amazing version that she sings from where I got the lyrics. So right, cool. uh, make sure you check out that version. Check out Sonny Rollins with Jim Hall. 
uh, and the incredible Kevin Hayes trio with Doug Weiss and Bill Stewart. So have happy holidays, Merry Christmas, uh, Happy New Year, and we'll see you right after that.
All the drums, the one and only Doug Rice at the bass. I'm Deckard Bro. Thanks so much. Have a great holiday season. We'll see you next year.